15, 16 years old. They wore OPA armbands. The boys spoke in loud, angry voices about tyranny and freedom. The girls watched the boys strut. The ancient animal story. The same whether it was on a spinning rock surrounded by hard vacuum or the stamp-sized chimpanzee preserves on Earth. Even in the belt, youth brought invulnerability, immortality, the unshakable conviction that for you, things would be different. The laws of physics would cut you a break. The missiles would never hit. The air would never hiss out into nothing. Maybe for other people, the patched together fighting ships of the OPA, the water haulers, the Martian gunships, the Scopuli, the Canterbury, the Donagen, the hundred other ships that had died in small actions since the system had turned itself into a battlefield. But not you. And when youth was lucky enough to survive its optimism, all Miller had left was a little fear, a little envy, and the overwhelming sense of life's fragility. But he had three months' worth of company script in his account, and a lot of free time, and the coffee wasn't bad. You need anything, sir? The waiter asked. He didn't look any older than the kids on the grass. Miller shook his head. Five days had passed since Star Helix pulled its contract. The governor of Ceres was gone, smuggled out on a transport before the news had gone wide. The Outer Planets Alliance had announced the inclusion of Ceres among official OPA-held real estate, and no one had said otherwise. Miller had spent the first day of his unemployment drunk, but his bender had an oddly pro forma feel. He descended into the bottle because it was familiar, because it was what you did when you'd lost the career that defined you. The second day, he'd gotten through the hangover. The third, he'd gotten bored. All through the station, Security forces were making the kind of display he'd expected. Preemptive peacekeeping. The few political rallies and protests ended fast and hard, and the citizens of Ceres didn't much care. Their eyes were on their monitors, on the war. A few locals with busted heads getting thrown into prison without charges were beneath notice. And Miller was personally responsible for none of it. The fourth day, he'd checked his terminal and discovered that 80% of his docking log requests had come through before Shadid had shut his access down. Over a thousand entries, any one of which could be the only remaining lead to Jewel Mao. So far, no Martian nukes were on their way to crack Ceres. No demands of surrender. No boarding forces. It could all change in a moment. But until it did, Miller was drinking coffee and auditing ship records. About one every 15 minutes. Miller figured that if Holden was the last ship in the log, he'd find him in about six weeks. The Adrianople, a third-gen prospector, had docked at Palace within the arrival window. Miller checked the open registration, frustrated again at how little information was there compared to the security databases. Owned by Strigo Anthony Abramowitz, eight citations for substandard maintenance, banned from Eros and Ceres as a danger to the port. An idiot and an accident waiting to happen. But the flight plan seemed legitimate, and the history of the ship was deep enough not to smell new minted. Miller deleted the entry. The badass motherfucker. A freight hauler doing a triangle between Luna, Ganymede, and the belt. Owned by MYOFB Corporation out of Luna. A query to the public bases at Ganymede showed it had left the port there at the listed time and just hadn't bothered to file a flight plan. Miller tapped the screen with a fingernail. Not exactly how he'd fly under the radar. Anyone with authority would roust that ship just for the joy of doing it. 
He deleted the entry. His terminal chimed. An incoming message. Miller flipped over to it. One of the girls on the common shrieked and the others laughed. A sparrow flew past, its wings humming in the constant recycler-driven breeze. Havelock looked better than when he'd been on series. Happy. The dark circles were gone from his eyes, and the shape of his face had subtly softened, as if the need to prove himself in the belt had changed his bones, and now he was falling back into his natural form. Miller, the recording said. I heard about Earth cutting series just before I got your message. Bad luck. I'm sorry to hear Shadid fired you. Between the two of us, she's a pompous idiot. The rumor I've heard is Earth is doing everything it can to stay out of the war, including giving up any station that it's expecting to be a point of contention. You know how it is. You've got a pit bull on one side of you and a Rottweiler on the other. First thing you do is drop your stake. Miller chuckled. I've signed on with Protogen Security. Big company, private army bullshit. But the pay is worth putting up with the delusions of grandeur. The contract's supposed to be on Ganymede, but with the crap going on right now, who knows how it'll really play out. Turns out Protogen's got a training base in the belt. I'd never heard about it, but it's supposed to be quite the gymnasium. I know they're hiring on, and I'd be happy to put in a word for you. Just let me know, and I'll get you together with the induction recruiter. Get you off that damned rock. Havelock smiled. Take care of yourself, partner, the Earther said. You can touch. Protogen. Pink water. A la beak. Small corporate security forces that the big transorbital companies use as private armies and mercenary forces to rent out as needed. Alan Sec had the palace security contract, and had for years, but it was Mars-based. The OPA was probably hiring, but probably not him. It had been years since he'd tried to find work. He'd assumed that particular struggle was behind him, that he was going to die working in the series station security contract. Now that events had thrown him out, everything had an odd, floating feeling. Like a gap between getting hit and feeling the pain. He needed to find another job. He needed to do more than send a couple messages out to his old partners. There were employment firms. There were bars on series that would hire an ex-cop or a bouncer. There were gray markets that would take anyone capable of giving them a veneer of legality. The last thing that made sense was to sit around ogling girls in the park and chasing down leads on a case that he hadn't been meant to follow up on in the first place. The day gun had come into series just a little ahead of the arrival window. Owned by the Glapian Collective, who were, he was pretty sure, an OVA fund. That made it a good fit. Except the flight plan had been put in just a few hours after the Donager blew, and the exit record from Io looked solid. Miller shifted it into a file he was keeping for ships that earned a second look. The Rosinante, owned by Silencieux Courant Holdings out of Luna, was a gas hauler that had landed at Tycho just hours before the end of the arrival window. Silencieux Courant was a medium-sized corporate entity with no obvious ties to the OPA, and the flight plan from Palace was plausible. Miller put his fingertip over the delete key, then paused. He sat back. Why was a gas hauler going between Palace and Tycho? Both stations were gas consumers. Flying from consumer to consumer without hitting a supply in the middle was a good way to not cover your vacuum fees. He put in a request for the flight plan that had taken the Rosinante to Paris from wherever it had been before, then sat back to wait. If the records were cached in the series servers, the request shouldn't take more than a minute or two. The notification bar estimated an hour and a half, so that meant the request was getting forwarded to the docking systems of Paris. 
It hadn't been in the local factory. Miller stroked his chin. Five days of stubble had almost reached the beginning of the beard. He felt a smile starting. He did a definition search on Rosinante, literally meaning no longer a workhorse. Its first entry was as the name of Don Quixote's horse. That you, Holden? Miller said to the screen. You out tilting at windmills? Sir, the waiter said, but Miller waved him away. There were hundreds of entries still to be looked at, and dozens at least in the second book folder. Miller ignored them, staring at the entry from Tycho as if by sheer force of will he could make more information appear on the screen. Then, slowly, he pulled up the message from Havelock, hit the respond key, and looked into the tiny black pinprick of the terminal's camera. Hey, partner, he said. Thanks for the offer. I may take you up on it. But I've got some kinks I need to work out before I jump. You know how it is. If you can do me a favor, though, I need to keep track of a ship, and I've only got the public databases to work from. Plus which, Ceres may be at war with Mars by now. Who knows, you know? Anyway, if you can put a level one watch on any flight plans for her, Drop me a note if anything comes up, and buy you a drink sometime. He paused. There had been something more to say. Take care of yourself, partner. He reviewed the message. On screen, he looked tired, the smile a little fake, the voice a little higher than it sounded in his head. But it said what it needed to say. He said, This was what he'd been reduced to. Access gone, service gun confiscated, though he still had a couple of drops in his hole. Money running out. He had to play the angles, call in favors for things that should have been routine, outthink the system for any scrap. He'd been a cop, and they turned him into a mouse. Still, he thought, sitting back in the chair, pretty good work for a mouse. The sound of detonation came from Spinwood. Then voices raised in anger. The kids on the common stopped their games of touch me, touch you, and stared. Miller stood up. There was smoke, but he couldn't see planes. The breeze picked up as the station air cleaners raised the flow to suck away particulates so the sensors didn't think there was a risk of fanning a fire. Three gunshots rang out in fast succession, and the voices came together in a rough chant. Miller couldn't make words out of it, but the rhythm told him all he needed to know. Not a disaster, not a fire, not a breach, just a riot. The kids were walking toward the commotion, Miller caught one by the elbow. She couldn't have been more than 16, her eyes near black, her face a perfect heart shape. Don't go over there, he said. Get your friends together and walk the other way. The girl looked at him, his hand on her arm, the distant commotion. You can't help, he said. She pulled her arm free. Gotta try, yeah, she said. Podria intentar, you know? You could too just did, Miller said as he put his terminal in its case and walked away. Behind him, the sounds of the riot grew, but he figured the police could take care of it. Over the next 14 hours, the system net reported five riots on the station, some minor structural damage. Someone he'd never heard of announced a tri-phase curfew people out of their holes more than two hours before or after their work shifts would be subject to arrest. Whoever was running the show now thought they could lock down six million people and create stability and peace. He wondered what Shadid thought about that. Outside Ceres, things were getting worse. The deep astronomy labs on Triton had been occupied by a band of prospectors sympathetic to the UPA. 
They'd turned the array in system and had been broadcasting the location of every Martian ship in the system, along with high definition images of the surface of Mars, down to the topless sunbathers in the dome parks. The story was that a volley of nukes was on its way to the station, and the array would be bright dust within a week. Earth's imitation of a snail was picking up the pace as Earth and Luna-based companies pulled back down the gravity well. Not all of them, not even half, but enough to send the Terran message, count us out. Mars appealed for solidarity. The belt appealed for justice, or more often, told the birthplace of humanity to go fuck itself. It wasn't out of control yet, but it was ramping up. Another few incidents, and it wouldn't matter how it had started. It wouldn't matter what the stakes were. Mars knew the belt couldn't win, and the belt knew it had nothing to lose. It was a recipe for death on a scale humanity had never seen. And, like Ceres, there wasn't much Miller could do about that, either. But he could find James Holden. Find out what had happened to the Scopuli. Follow the leads back to Julie Mao. He was a detective. It was what he did. As he packed up his home, throwing out the collected detritus that grew over decades like a crust, he talked to her. He tried to explain why he'd given up everything to find her. After his discovery of the Rosinante, he could hardly avoid the word quixotic. His imaginary Julie laughed or was touched. She thought he was a sad, pathetic little man, since just tracking her down was the nearest to a purpose in life he could find. She dressed him down as being a tool of her parents, she wept and put her arms around him. She sat with him in some almost unimaginable observation lounge and watched the stars. He fit everything he had into a shoulder bag. Two changes of clothes, his papers, his hand terminal, a picture of canvas from back in better days. All the hard copy of Julie's case he'd made before Shadid wiped his partition, including three pictures of Julie. He thought that everything he'd lived through should have added up to more, and then changed his mind. It was probably about right. He spent one last day ignoring the curfew, making his rounds of the station, saying goodbye to the few people he felt he might miss or he might miss him. To his surprise, Muss, who he found at a tense and uncomfortable police bar, actually teared up and hugged him until his ribs ached from it. 